So before chair, you start through the chair, I'm gonna just say really quickly, para participantes, y que necesitan, um, la, escuche la junta en español, por favor de llamar a 1-877-568-4106. Y ingrese este número de clave a 877-394-8692. El símbolo de número. Thank you, Mitzi. Um, welcome, everybody. Bienvenidos um, uh, to the North Oaks Community Council meeting for the month of May 2020. Um, as we are all aware, this is an unprecedented time in our world's history. As of May 6, 2020, the World Health Organization reported 3,672,000 238 confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide, with 215 countries reporting incidents of, uh, incidents of infection. Here at home in March, the six Bay Area health officers took the extraordinary measure of issuing a shelter-in-place order requiring all individuals to stay at home except to take care of the most essential needs. Later, on March 19, the governor of California issued a statewide shelter in place order. The Bay Area Health Officers orders have now been extended through May 31st, just a few days away. In light of the current situation and in recognition of the CDC's social distancing guidelines, which discourage public gatherings, the governor suspended certain provisions of the Ralph M. Brown Act to allow local legislative bodies to conduct their meetings telephonically or by other electronic means. If you are viewing this meeting online, the North Fair Oaks Community Council members today will be connecting to this meeting either by video or audio. County staff, including our county council, as well as any staff who are representing, uh, who are presenting items tonight, will also be participating electronically. As printed on the North Fair Oaks Community Council's agenda, members of the public desiring to connect on agenda, uh, to comment on agenda items, email written comments to the email address communityaffairs at SMC gov.org at least 24 hours in advance of the meeting. If you were not able to submit your comments at least 24 hours prior to this meeting, you can still submit your comments and we will try to read them into the record during the meeting. Please note, however, that our North Fair Oaks Community Council has limited administrative staff and so it might not be possible for staff to monitor all the emails that are coming in and read them during the meeting. If staff is unable to do so, then those emails which have been received less than 24 hours prior to today's meeting will still be forwarded to North Fair Oaks Community Council members and will still become part of the administrative record. Please note that public comments are limited to one comment per item and should be commensurate with the two minutes customarily allowed for verbal comments, which is approximately 200 to 300 words. And finally, we realize that holding a North Ferros Community Council meeting electronically may be a little more difficult than our normal processes. So I want to thank everyone, my fellow North Ferros Community Council members, county staff, and any members of the public present for their patience during this time. And if we can get started with roll call, Mitzi, that would be great. Thank you, Ever. Before we start with roll call, I do have to mention that for all those attending the meeting on Zoom video conference, we will use the raise the hand feature in order to organize any public comment. During the general public comment period, and for each item on the regular agenda, 
I will ask those members of the public who wish to comment to click the raise hand feature to raise your hand and to speak on the agenda item. For those joining by phone, please press dial uh, star nine to indicate your desire to speak. Please note that the members of the public must wait for our prompt in connection with each agenda item before using the raise the hand function. For example, you cannot raise your hand at the beginning of the meeting for an agenda item that is later in the meeting. When you hear your name called, we will prompt you to unmute your account and inform you that you have you may be, uh, begin speaking. Thank you for all your patience. To the chair, I will now do roll call. Thank you. Chair Everardo Rodriguez. Here. Vice Chair Juan Carlos Prado. Here. Council Member Beatriz Cerillo. Here. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Linda Lopez. Council member Linda Lopez. So she she sent me just a text saying that she um, she's here, but she cannot unmute um, herself. Okay. Uh, Council member Blair Whitney. Here. Council member Jennifer Reese. Here. Council member Rosaura Lopez. Council member Rosario Lopez. I, I also see her on the screen, but I don't, oh, I think she unmuted herself. Not sure. Council member Rosario Lopez. Here. Thank you. And youth member Francis Santos. That's it, thank you, Council uh, Chair. Thanks very much, Mitzi. And um, is there any public comment? There are no public comments at this time. Well, oh, just a second. Actually, there is one public comment just now. Um, I see here um, Brooks Esser. Um, he has raised his hand. Um, please accept this request and unmute your microphone and then you may begin speaking. You will have two minutes to make your comment. Thank you very much. Just a short comment. I just wanted to thank all the members of the North Fair Oaks Community Council and the county staff for holding this meeting um, in such an extraordinary time. Uh, the effort is truly appreciated by members of the community. That's all I wanted to say tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you. Are there any other public comments on Zoom? at this time. Okay, um, and then if there are no other public comments, um, Brooks, you may lower your hand. Um, how about on the phone line, Victor? Are there any public comments there? There are none at this moment. Okay. Thank you, Sandy Chair, we turn it back to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sandy. Um, at this point, we will move on to um, item number three on the agenda, which is uh, an informational update um, a COVID-19 um, by health department. And um, the presenter will be Shriga Srinivasan from the health system. Good evening, Chair Rodriguez, Vice Chair Prado, and Council members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening, and thank you to the members of the public who have joined as well. Uh, my name is Sri Jasrinavasan, and I'm Deputy Chief for County Health, your local public health department. And I planned to spend just a bit of time updating you on our current uh, statistics uh, with COVID-19 um, using the dashboard that County Health makes available to the public, as well as a few comments um, 
reinforcing what County Health Officer Scott Morrow and Health Chief Louise Rogers shared with the Board of Supervisors, the County Board of Supervisors on Tuesday, um, relative to how we are faring um, relative to the metrics that the state and the local health officers have outlined to track our progress. I wanna begin with just gratitude to everyone in the North Fair Oaks community in this um, very challenging time. Um, as a public health professional, we're truly humbled by uh, all that our community is um, shouldering and we appreciate the leadership of the council, uh, the unity and the community represented by the people who've chosen to join this meeting. And um, we just recognize uh, how challenging um, these circumstances are uh, for all of us and have great appreciation for all of you. So at this point, I wanted to just share my screen and go to our dashboard. Is that visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, there are several data that we track to monitor how we are doing as a community, the impact of the virus, and some key areas that um, inform us in the public health uh, profession, as well as uh, aim to provide meaningful information to the public. As of May 27th, we had 2022 COVID-19 lab confirmed positive cases. And um, of those, uh, we have also had 82 fatalities. The fatalities um, we look at closely both by age and by race and ethnicity. And I'm trying to navigate Zoom so that I can see the whole screen. Um, of the 82 deaths, 52 uh, were among people who were white, 16 Asian, 12 Latino, and two black or African American. We also present information on um, the hospital capacity because a key aspect of mitigating the virus has to do with the growth in the cases, not um, happening more quickly than what our community hospitals can shoulder um, should people require hospitalization. And as of the dashboard, which is a, of a day ago, we've had, we have 54 COVID-19 hospitalized patients, but you would be able to see that we actually have a lot of hospital capacity available for anyone who would need that level of care about 97% of medical surgical beds, about 91% of ventilators, and about 52% of intensive care unit beds remain available. So this is an area that we have um, strength as a community. We have, as a community, conducted 31,481 lab tests as of um, yesterday. And of those who have been tested, a positivity rate of 6.5%. One thing we look at is that that positivity rate has been going down as testing has become more available. <clears throat> we have displayed a map of COVID positive cases. Frankly, as the health officer has advised, because of testing constraints, we don't put great credence in what we can draw in geographic terms around the case data. We expect this to be much more meaningful as, case, uh, as testing capacity expands. We have had a focus in county health around uh, congregate living facilities and long-term care facilities. So of our 2022 cases, 378 of them have occurred uh, related to congregate settings, a skilled nursing home, an assisted living facility, or a board and care home. And those 378 cases have also been related to 50 of the 82 fatalities. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen to just speak to you and make eye contact. 
remind myself how to do this. Thank you for your patience. Um, what we have been uh, tracking uh, along with our colleague Bay Area counties are, are several, more than a dozen measures laid out by the state as well as the Bay Area health officers as to how our mitigation and the spread of the virus are reflected for our residents. And in many of the areas, we are doing quite well, but there are a few areas that we uh, are not at the benchmark that the state has established for further opening than what we have currently in the shelter in place with the um, opening uh, uh, allowances that the health officer relayed on May 18th, which allow, for example, outdoor businesses um, and of course, essential activities, as long as we continue social distancing measures such as facial coverings, you know, the frequent hand washing, six feet uh, distance. The two areas that we still have to continue to make progress are around the case growth and the hospitalization growth. So the state benchmark for uh, case growth is less than 25 new cases per, per 100,000 residents over the last 14 days. And we have, um, that would be around 192 cases over the last 14 days. And we have around 470 cases in the last 14 days. We have been very focused in getting testing to the places of the highest risk, the congregate care facility. So we are not surprised and we actually um, expected to find cases in those settings that we could res respond quickly and assure protection of anyone in um, that setting and assure the appropriate next action for those residents. But that is an area that we're really watching to guide any further opening. And a second area that we still continue to have room has to do with um, the growth in the um, hospitalization rate, both the state metrics and the Bay Area Health Officer metrics would want us to see that flatten or decline. And the seven day average um, percent change to be less than 5%. We do have a lot of hospital capacity available to us, but we haven't seen hospitalizations flatten. The, course of the virus, continuing to find people who are ill as testing has ramped up. We, we do have the virus, you know, transmitting. And um, that's why we have to continue to urge um, adherence to the social distancing requirements and uh, caution and protection for all of our well-being and the well-being of the community as a whole. I'll go through quickly the other areas that the state and the local health officers have set metrics um, to give you an assessment of where we are. Um, a key focus that's had also a lot of media attention has to do with how much testing is going on. The metric we are aiming to exceed is around 1,500 tests per day. And on our days with the most tests received, we exceed that already. Uh, and we are feeling um, pretty confident that we have that testing capacity in the community. And as things continue to mobilize, that is a metric that we are positioned to meet. What we've been working on is how to align that capacity to uh, the most vulnerable populations, those in congregate settings, as I've mentioned, also any communities that have um, concentrations of difficulty in access, concentrations of populations that have been marginalized, concentrations of essential workers. And so we have, um, through the leadership of the Board of Supervisors and the leadership of our county manager, been mobilizing um, community testing at different locations and do ha have a request to the state to expand those locations um, uh, that we are waiting to hear um, from the state on. The next area has to do with the public health preparedness 
as we consider uh, additional opening. And that is so that as there's more economic activity and more um, social activity, do we have the infrastructure to identify cases quickly and investigate any positive case and any contacts of a positive case? And we have presented a plan to the Board of Supervisors a couple of weeks ago that was um, uh, well received and encouraged. And we believe we are well positioned to have the contact investigation capacity to ramp up over time to keep up with the case growth. Another area has to do with, do we have enough hospital capacity, which as I mentioned earlier, we believe we do pretty well on this in this arena. A next area has to do with the skilled nursing facility sector in particular. You likely know that San Mateo County has a higher proportion of older adults than almost any county in the state and also among the highest in the country. So our skilled nursing facilities are just essential entities for um, safe housing and care for many of our elders. And um, we do have, uh, have had a robust focus on these facilities and great partnership with many of these facilities and uh, believe that we're well positioned for the skilled nursing facilities to meet their responsibilities. We also have had four facilities take on even additional um, clinical uh, protection responsibility such that they could serve as a center of excellence uh, for COVID positive patients needing skilled nursing facility care and really appreciate um, that we have facilities able to act in that way. An area that the skilled nursing facilities continue to be challenged by is sufficient personal protective equipment, PPE. Um, we've all learned lots of new acronyms over the last 13 weeks. Um, flattening the curve and SIP and PPE. Um, and the personal protective equipment shortages have been noted and um, we've definitely uh, taken every action we can as a county to shore up the backup supply for facilities that uh, don't have a robust supply chain themselves. And what we see among the skilled nursing facilities, many of which we visited um, several hundred of them, over 300 of them over the last few weeks to provide outreach and technical assistance to understand their PPE needs and where they are, um, to support them in understanding how to cohort patients, should that be necessary if they have a COVID positive case. And there are some supplies that they are not well positioned to sustain on their own. So that's a metric that we're watching. We also would need to assure that the county could provide sufficient um, housing capacity, safe isolation capacity for residents unable to do so in their existing residential situation. Um, the county has mobilized resources for this need and we believe we are well positioned in this area. Um, and we also have the ability to provide the kinds of guidance that the state has laid out in its expectations for any county to move beyond the state's metric for where uh, they would like to open. You may know that the uh, state has, you know, a phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four approach. And San Mateo County and our Bay Area uh, neighboring counties are in this phase two with much of the state. Some counties and the state's announcements on Monday enable some activities that are in phase three, um, such as some gatherings uh, as announced by the governor in uh, houses of worship, as well as in-store um, retail, and then recently around uh, hair salons. San Mateo County has not taken an action to seek attestation to go faster than the state's opening. We are, um, we and our Bay Area colleague counties around us are in the stage two. Uh, the health officer uh, relayed to the Board of Supervisors on Tuesday that he um, was closely reviewing what the governor announced around uh, religious institutions, around in-store retail, uh, retail in-store presence, um, as well as um, the feedback received about summer camps uh, and childcare. And um, he relayed that we would expect to see more guidance in those arenas very soon. 
I know that you have a very full agenda with many distinguished speakers, so I wanted to make sure to leave time for your questions. Um, and, you know, had a few other factoids, but um, would not want to curtail the time for dialogue um, that, or questions that you may have of me. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Srinivasan, for your report. Um, very enlightening and informative. And um, at this point, I uh, would like to ask my fellow Norfolk Community Council members if they have any questions or comments on this agenda item. You can, you can raise your hand. And I can, I can get started. Uh, it looks like Linda, Linda Lopez has her hand raised. Go ahead, Linda. It looks like we, we cannot hear you, Linda. Um, so she texted me uh, her question and essentially she's, she's asking, um, uh, what is the status of the uh, Ferox uh, family clinic uh, since um, that is, you know, one of the major concerns here in North Ferox? Um, so there have been no significant changes planned for the Ferox Health Center's operations. I believe um, Chief Rogers uh, spoke with you, was it two months ago at your meeting? Um, Correct. Um, at the time, there were not specific uh, changes planned for the Ferox Health Center. Of course, our clinic um, really took seriously the social distancing guidelines to pivot to a televisit model to enable any um, patient of ours to uh, receive the services they need uh, like this <laughs> through teledelivery. Um, and I believe um, more than 80% of our visits are being delivered uh, through teledelivery uh, for medical needs. We also maintain in-person pre in presence for those needs that require in-person attendance. Um, and we continue to uh, strive to meet um, our patients' needs while also enabling them to maintain the social distance that keeps them safe. And, and, and their families safe. We're uh, reviewing our remobilization plans and um, are in the phase of thinking through deferred care. You know, at the same time, we wanna assure maximum protection. We don't want care, necessary care to be delayed such that it, um, any condition would get more serious. And um, the medical center team is working through with the Fair Oaks leadership what that may look like and, and the guidance received from any patient's primary care provider, you know, to not, um, to balance those risks of deferred care that should be attended to, you know, sooner rather than later. Is that responsive, Linda? I, I, since I can't see you. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to tell, but uh, thank you for your um, reply. Um, one of the questions I had was, um, is, uh, are there pockets of infections of, of infections um, where cases congregate around um, the county, or is it pretty well spread out? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we are most concerned about clusters in facilities in which the frequency of the spread could be uh, very quick, and that's why we're focused on the congregate care facilities that I mentioned, trying to get to around 400 of them to make an assessment, offer assistance, et cetera. Over the last few weeks, uh, we don't have full data of this because frankly, it would take universal testing to really know from an epidemiological perspective, you know, how is the distribution geographically relative to the population? So the approach in the communicable disease team within our public health division is as we're learning about cases and engaging in contact investigation, just really connecting the dots so that if there's a mini cluster that we might see based on proximity of addresses together, 
we try to address that from a community perspective as opposed to a this residence today, that residence tomorrow. We try instead to cluster the investigation also to build trust with the community of um, why we need to work together so that we can understand if you're COVID positive, we wanna know um, who you have been in contact with. We wanna maximally protect you. We wanna understand who could be at risk of exposure that we could engage with to assure their maximum protection and assure that you have the resources to safely isolate or quarantine so that you get the level of support uh, that you need. I don't have any specific neighborhoods to report on and we also have to balance privacy and the like. And I do get asked fairly regularly and I also receive um, questions that Dr. Morrow receives with questions wondering like, should I be concerned about my neighborhood or my geographic area? And this may be very difficult, but we all have to live with um, some expectation that there's community transmission. That is the nature of this virus and really adhere to the facial coverings when we're outside, the social distancing and you know the, the components of the shelter in place order. Right, thank you. And, and finally, I, I wanted to ask if the resources that you shared, the uh, numbers and statistics, uh, that you shared on the screen. Are those um, available on the county website that anybody yes. can look at? Great. Yes. And if um, Mitzi doesn't already have, it's just at smchealth.org. And then there's a pretty um, prominent COVID-19 box to check on. There's a different link for the data, which many people do not have the stamina to go through all the data. Right. <laughs> there's also a link for the orders you know, as the health officer updates those orders, as well as resources. We have some videos and public service announcements in multiple languages. Um, you know, we really understand our obligation to communicate with the public and uh, to keep earning your trust and, you know, strive to keep getting better at that. Thank you very much. Um, Mitzi, I don't see any other hands raised at this point. Really sure, correct. No other hands are raised. And is there any public comment on this item. Okay, so if we're opening up to public comment uh, for this item, uh, do not see any raised hands on the Zoom call. Uh, Victor Hernandez, are there any raised hands? Or are there any questions um, on the line? There's none at the moment. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Chair Rodriguez. Thanks very much. Um, in that case, um, Thank you again, Ms. Um, Sharon Navasan, for your report. Um, and um, we will move on to item number four on the agenda, which is uh, an informational update. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually item number um, five. Am I correct? No, 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 wait. Let me look at the, it's, it's item number four, I'm sorry. Um, so this is another um, update in regards to COVID-19, but in this case is by the Redwood City School District. And it'll be presented by uh, Nancy McGee, who's the County Superintendent of Schools. Great, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and thank you, uh, council members, for having me at the meeting. I've, uh, this is my first Fair Oaks uh, community meeting, and I'm really thrilled to be part of it. And hope to attend again in the future. So um, my perspective is coming from the county uh, of San Mateo. Uh, I help support all 23 school districts, including the Redwood City School District. Um, so I'm going to talk through the approach we're taking uh, to support all of our school districts in their individual planning. Um, many of the districts are just now beginning their planning for coming back to school. Um, but I'm going to take you through the framework that we're providing to all the districts to guide that action. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, I, I do think it's important for people to know the difference between the roles of, the, of Dr. Morrow, the health officer, and the county superintendent. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I will do some overview of the pandemic recovery framework for schools. 
and then talk about how schools are planning um, and what their reopening might look like. So next slide. <clears throat> so as um, Shrija just shared with us, right now we know that there's 2,022 2 active positive COVID-19 cases in the county with 82 deaths. Um, what this tells us is that the modifications we're all making in our lives, in our social lives, wearing face coverings out in public and sheltering at home um, will continue until there's a vaccine widely available um, to change the, the health conditions in the community. Um, the modifications that we're seeing in schools will also be um, long-term until there's a, a, a broad access of the community to a vaccine. And um, so as we make plans to go back to school, we're not just planning for a month or two, we're planning for the entire school year. And there's a lot of flexibility in the plans to respond if conditions get better and improve and if conditions um, diminish and get worse. So the second wave is of, uh, of a surge or a spike in the spread is a real threat. And we have to be very mindful of that and aware of that as we go back to school. We know that in um, international examples, like in Japan and Denmark and China, where they've had full country shutdowns, um, much like we're in right now, and then reopen schools and come back, about 15% of families continue to decide to stay at home, to learn at home and to work from home because they just don't feel, um, either they have uh, health conditions that put them at greater risk or they're just not comfortable being out in the community yet without um, the vaccine widely available. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> So many people wonder who, who makes the decisions when schools open or close. Um, the experiences we've been having over the last four months have been driven, of course, by public, a public health emergency. Therefore, the public health officer, Dr. Morrow, is um, writing the school modification orders and determining that we can attend school or learn school, learn, do our learning in school or do our learning at home. So the health officer is the ultimate authority on that. The county superintendent is collecting the data, the information of what's happening in the local school districts, and then trying to synthesize that information and make it available to everybody so it can be useful and um, actionable. The health officer is the one who writes and signs the health orders. The county superintendent helps schools implement the orders. So it's not a, a simple thing to, to, to have everybody go home and start learning and teaching from remote locations. So the County Office of Education has been providing all of our school districts, including Redwood City, a lot of support in that area. And then, um, as we uh, determine that there may be positive cases inside a school community, so we have to take action to, to communicate that out and um, close the school for cleaning, et cetera, the health officer and the, and the county superintendent work together um, on those communications. And then when it comes to testing, whether um, uh, and delivering the, the community testing, the health officer is completely in um, control of that and organizing and implementing testing. When we go back to school, the health officer will also oversee testing. It would not be something that schools would operate or run themselves. Go ahead and next slide. So as we go back to school, we're using four pillars to guide us. Um, these are all the pillars about health conditions and providing the proper health conditions in school to ensure that it's not only safe for children, but also safe for the staff and the adults, the teachers, the administrators. They're actually more at risk. There have been zero deaths in California um, due to COVID-19 
for um, young people ages zero to 17. And while there have been um, some fatalities across the country, um, in California, we have yet to have any. So it's not our youngsters that are most at risk. It is our adult population and all of the staff that we have to be mindful of as we go back to school. So the four pillars um, are nothing that, you know, not surprising, nothing that you haven't already heard, um, but they have to be in place in a school in order to ensure that it's, it's, um, it's not going to, not going to be a place where community spread happens. So the first pillar is about health and hygiene, um, building in hand washing routines during the school day, um, certainly, students and children wash their hands when at school, but not necessarily as part of a routine that they're being directed to do. So this kind of thing needs to needs to be built into the school day. Um, when when children come on campus, they'll be uh, have a health screening. Um, like many businesses, will take a, a temperature scan, and anybody who's outside the normal temperature range would go go. Um, to the office for a secondary check. Um, if they have a temperature outside the range, they would go home for follow-up with their medical provider. And then there's also cleaning protocols that are under the health and hygiene pillar. It's really important, the cleaning that goes on in the school um, between days, between classes, and things like that. The second pillar is around face coverings, and we know that um, San Mateo County right now is under an order to wear face coverings in public. The reason for that is a face covering is very effective in reducing the, the respiratory droplets that contribute to the spread of the disease. So um, it is the um, advice and recommendation of the health officer that um, everyone at school is wearing a face covering. And we are saying children who are kindergarten age through 12th grade or age 22 if they're in special education, would come to school wearing a face covering. We want them to be comfortable and easy for kids to use. Certainly people who have um, health impairments that would um, endanger them if they had a mask on, they would be exempt. And any children with special needs who don't have the ability to put on or take off their mask on their un, under their own mobility would also be exempt. But other than that, children will arrive wearing face coverings and it will be like a, another article of clothing, clothing like a jacket or a sweater. They, we would want the children to have several different face coverings wearing a clean one to school every day. Schools will provide disposable face coverings for children and adults that um, come to the campus without the covering. We will want the children to wear uh, and the adults to wear the coverings when they're out on the campus moving around. And then we highly recommend that the, the, they continue to wear them inside the classroom. But if it will be up to the individual teacher to determine if the face coverings are really detrimental to the learning, then they can come, come off but we need to recognize that the face covering really protects the environment and makes a much healthier and, and safer environment for everybody. So as much as possible, we would want everyone to wear the face coverings in the classrooms themselves. Physical distancing is something that you've certainly heard a lot about. It's trying to stay six feet apart. Um, in classrooms, uh, that will sort of determine the size or the number of children who can be in a classroom at once. Um, if a classroom can support, say, um, 15 to 16 children in, uh, in seated for learning and still be six feet apart, then the classroom could be of that size. Some classrooms are larger than others, some are smaller. And we're encouraging schools to use outdoor spaces, outdoor classrooms, and larger areas to create learning spaces like the cafeteria or the multi-use room or the gymnasium. And then finally, especially when schools first start, we are asking that they limit gatherings. Uh, a classroom or class instruction does not qualify as a gathering, that's a class. A gathering would be a meeting that's outside the normal learning environment. So say a staff meeting or a a parent meeting, 
we would want to use remote um, um, tools to do those meetings virtually as opposed to in person. And right now there's zero a ga- a limit on gatherings in San Mateo County of, I believe it's um, no gatherings at all, but I, I imagine that as we open up, it will become gatherings of 10, for instance. So the schools will reflect whatever the gathering size is in the community. We won't be have a separate number from what is um, acceptable out in the neighborhoods and the communities. But those are the four conditions that are really going to drive um, the safe return to school. Um, if we can go to the next slide. And we will take a step-by-step approach when the schools are planning right now to open on the regularly scheduled first day of the 2020-2021 school year. So um, I'm not sure which date Redwood City is opening, but um, many of our districts are opening the week of August 19th. So it might be somewhere around there. Um, For the first several weeks of school, we're going to ask that they schools implement the the strictest level of um, control with no on-campus visitors, including no volunteers on campus, Um, no extracurricular activities outside of classroom learning, no gatherings with all meetings being held remotely, and then face coverings being worn at all time. It's important that we get school off to a good, strong start because uh, we're very concerned that if we see a spike in spread in the community, we might have to revert back to sheltering in place and learning at home. And we'd like to, we'd like to have the, op- the option to do uh, in-person learning on campus, support those families who will be at home with distance learning. And then some schools will have um, A and B groups that may go to school on different days in order to meet the requirements for physical distancing. Next slide. So we're also basing the return to school on the concept of a stable cohort. So a stable cohort means that we've got a a defined group of kids whose size is determined by the classroom space. So again, if a classroom can support 16 children in a classroom, then that would be the stable cohort. Then we want them to uh, reduce as much mixing with other groups as is practical. We can't reduce them entirely 100% because that wouldn't really, school wouldn't really be able to function that way. So a music teacher could come in to the cohort. Um, Students can go outside and um, uh, to other classrooms. Say they go to another class of a math class. That's, that would be allowed, but We would do things like um, in an elementary school, perhaps divide the school into four quadrants. Each quadrant or wing would have its own restroom facilities. So the different groups of of kids would be assigned to a particular restroom. Doing that assignment helps minimize the random mixing and interaction on a school campus. It's more controlled. Um, and, And everything that can stabilize the environment helps it be healthier and safer, and school can continue that way. Next slide. Um, Oh, yep, I am finished. So um, I'll leave it up to questions right now. I know you probably have maybe some questions that are specific to the plans that school districts will be coming up with, and I can talk in generalities about what folks are thinking, Um, but I do know that the Redwood City School District has its planning team in place. Um, Developing the framework at the county level, we had Antonio Perez, who was a member of our working group. He is uh, a district administrator in Redwood City. And um, also, just on Tuesday, I held a webinar for all the private and independent and charter school heads in the county. So we um, are sharing this information with all of the charter schools and independent private schools as well. So I'm happy to take any questions at this time, and we can stop with the screen sharing so that I can um, be able to engage. Thank you, Ms. McGee, for your report. Uh, that's great information. Um, and 
I don't see any uh, hand raised. Uh, I do have a couple of questions and I can get started with uh, that. So one of my questions is, um, has there been any special support uh, or training for the teachers now um, having to teach online? Yes, yeah, so um, that happened overnight, as you know. And so the teachers were pretty amazing to be flexible and adapt. Of course, it wasn't perfect. It's not what anybody planned for or really wanted. Um, but one thing that's happened is many, many students have been um, supplied now with a, a device, a Chromebook or a hotspot, some kind of uh, distance learning tool that they can use. In addition, um, there have been um, schools have been doing planning, but where they really do some deeper professional development will be over the summertime. And the County Office of Education is partnering with the um, community college district, and we're providing three sessions of two-week courses for teachers in the, in the fundamentals of distance learning. And um, that training will also um, involve teachers developing units that they can um, roll out on the first day of school, if you will. So I think you'll see um, districts will continue to provide distance learning because um, it will be necessary for those families that aren't comfortable coming to school, but also in order to support the physical distancing on campuses. And I think we'll see um, growth and strengthening skills in that area for our teachers. Thanks very much. And I see Juan Carlos has raised his hand. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I wanted to uh, uh, thank for this uh, presentation. Um, I think I have a, maybe a different or unique uh, perspective since I've been a uh, high school teacher at Woodside and been a high school district in uh, Sequoia High School District for 18 years. Yeah, I'm and sure you do have a, a unique perspective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to thank all the all, all the information and support coming from the the, the county. Um, as we take this, you know, week, week on week and semester at a time and a year at a time. Um, but pertaining in particular to our North Fair Oaks area, um, since we do have a variety of different uh, educational institutions from elementary up to high school, ch uh, charter high school, is there um, any um, a, a different support that you're providing the elementary schools as opposed to the, the high schools? Is there a, a difference there as far as what you're suggesting the districts to do? Yes. Yeah, so um, we were really focused on getting the framework um, put together. It was a lot of research and data and collection of information. Um, we just released that framework um, this week to school administrators for their planning teams. And now what we're doing is I, I met with um, several of the high school district superintendents today on specifically focused on secondary issues and the ways in which high schools operate. And then I have another uh, meeting tomorrow with the other um, superintendents of the high school districts um, to focus specifically on that middle school, high school um, um, environment. I myself am a high school person. I was a high school English teacher for 20 years and on a campus for 25 years. So. I really understand the high school dynamic. Um, and high school is much more complicated to um, implement uh, something like a stable cohort, but the superintendents are really internalizing and understanding the, the, the four pillars, and they're coming up with fantastic ideas. So for instance, um, you know, many high schools operate with six or seven periods in a day and kids are moving from class to class to class. Um, we, I have challenged the, the districts to think differently about their schedule, their block schedule, where you have longer class periods, but fewer classes in a day is uh, a much more um, uh, effective way to educate during a COVID-19 situation. And I think many of the of the high school districts are seriously considering some kind of block or quarter schedule um, that reduces the number of classes a student and a teacher has um, for the week. So that reduces the number of 
interactions and contacts and movement around the school. Um, so to answer your question, we are now starting to break down now that we have the framework, starting to break down by grade band and support the leaders to develop the plans according to um, their, their student populations. Great. Thank you. Uh, one, one other question I had uh, was in regards to the parents. Has the communication with parents uh, suffered due to the reduced contact for COVID-19 or how, how, how is the communication taking place? I, I think that's going to be a mixed bag, you know, depending on which parents you're asking. Um, I think most schools have asked their teachers to try and be in contact with parents at least once, you know, once every couple of weeks or once a week. Um, that's more probably than they would be in contact with their, with directly with parents if kids were coming to school. Um, and I know that the districts have been providing lots and lots of information and written communication out to the communities, um, sometimes two and three and four times a week, providing updates because the information changes so quickly. So in that way, I think parents have been getting a lot of information. I know that some districts have been holding um, town halls for their parent community so that they can, you know, listen to the information all together and submit questions. Um, and then they are uh, all now just planning, uh, assembling their planning committees for, for, for kicking off or launching the new school year. Um, I know some families uh, probably feel less supported in this environment because all of a sudden, just like teachers overnight turned into distance learning teachers and students turned into kids who are learning in their own bedrooms, um, parents are finding themselves overnight uh, being the middle, the middle uh, teacher trying to support their child and understand what the teacher's doing and trying to sort out all the technology. And I've heard lots and lots of stories about parent fatigue, um, you know, being really uh, anxious, the kinds of stress that it causes in the family. From the County Office of Education, we've been supporting the idea of focusing on mental health and wellness through all of this. We can't just jump to um, the same level of instruction that we were getting when all kids were in classrooms at school. So we have to be patient. We have to be mindful that kids need to take breaks. They need to get outside um, to let them have some autonomy and power in learning how to take on uh, all of this and not have parents um, standing over their shoulders every second because, you know, that's what, what, what is happening because parents are at home. Kids are there learning. So um, it's a really tough dynamic to navigate. And I think hopefully, God willing, everyone comes out stronger for it in the end. Um, we certainly have learned a lot about communication and family dynamics through all of this as we've been locked up with our family members for eight or nine weeks here. Thank you. And I see uh, Rosada's uh, raise hand. Yes. Yes, I have a, uh, a question. Um, are, are you planning um, to provide a training to the uh, parents and students to they understand how important it is to follow the uh, new rules because this is something new for everyone, for the uh, students, for the parents, for the staff of the schools, and how important it is to you know cover their uh, face, follow uh, all the rules, and also if uh, you want to provide the information in different language, especially here in Norfolk. A lot of uh, our uh, residents speak Spanish, so I don't know if you uh, are planning to provide training or somehow, you know, send the information from the county to the uh, parents, because I think it's very important to they uh, understand, especially the parents, to guide their uh, child, their children. So. Um, 
I don't know you have any uh, plans yeah, with that. that. That's such an important question. Um, the best way to be successful with the framework is that we educate everyone. Uh-huh. And we do have a plan to, uh, to do that. By the end of next week, we hope to have a, a summary, an executive summary of the framework that I'm referencing. Um, a very short, concise summary for community members that will be uh, translated into four different languages and will be available out to all community members. Um, So that will be the beginning. Um, We also will be providing other materials for schools like posters and brochures and handouts that can go home. Um, But we also will uh, are going to be um, uh, delivering training for school staff um, as they come back to school. And then we will be developing uh, short little videos for parents and um, providing curriculum for, for the students. So we hope to hit all the levels, all the layers of the community and provide materials to do just what you're saying, make sure everybody understands the importance. Because it's it won't work if all we do is give the rule you have to wear a face covering. Mm-hmm. Everybody has to understand why that's so important. And um, we believe that, you know, this is about science. It is about medicine. It is about, um, it's happening to the whole world. It's a current event. It's there's a lot of rich learning material just in understanding what's happening to us right now as a, as a community. And we're going to very, very much be providing materials to all of our districts um, and emphasizing that point. Thank you. And we're, we're going to take the last question from uh, council member Linda Lopez. Um, she, I guess her mic is still not working. So she texted me her question and that says, um, what is the purpose of June meetings to discuss neighborhood schools? The district made decisions to close um, a, some neighborhood school, uh, uh, neighborhood school at Fair Oaks. And what, she's asking, what is the plan? And are the parents involved in that plan? So I know um, that Dr. Baker will be joining uh, probably your next meeting and will be able to talk about the specific plan that they will be developing for Redwood City. Um, It's my understanding that as the districts are putting together their planning teams, that it involves parents, um, that there is parent representation. Um, I I think they are just doing a district planning and planning for all the schools. Then the school principals are going to have to lead their own process um, to implement the district plan at the school level. Um, So districts are using the month of June to do their planning. They, their goal is to be able to share out all the information about the, the new school year four to six six weeks before school starts. So if school starts in August 19th, then the week of July 13th um, is sort of a target date for districts to be, have their full plans ready and be be working with their parent community about how it's gonna work. Um, And in the meantime, I'm sure there'll be board meetings and other planning meetings that parents can tune into and pay attention to so they can follow what's being discussed. Thank you very much. Um, Is is there any public comment on this item? So we're opening up for public comment on item number four of the agenda. I don't see any raised hands on the Zoom call. Uh, Victor, are there any questions on the line? None whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much again, Ms. McGee, for your report. Thank you we very hope to much see you for soon. having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And we will move on to next item, uh, number five, 
uh, informational update. Um, and this will, will be uh, the Ferox Community Center uh, on COVID-19 impacts, uh, rental and food assistance uh, presented by Terry Chin, Community Services Manager, um, uh, Human Services at the Ferox Community Center. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. So actually, so my title is Human Services Manager. I work for the City of Redwood City. And in that capacity, I do manage the Ferrell's Community Center. I mean, I will share a PowerPoint uh, shortly, but I'm just gonna start with a little background on the rent relief piece. I'm gonna be talking about two things, about rent relief, and then I'm also gonna talk about food assistance. On the rent relief piece, I just wanted to give a little background in that about mid-March, we were, I was actually approached by the Redwood City Education Foundation director because they were thinking about what was happening. The schools were about to close and they were wondering what was going to go on. We didn't quite have the stay at home order yet. They reached out to us because their board decided that they wanted to take an initiative to try to raise funds to help families from the school district thinking about both food security but also thinking about housing and helping keep people housed. So that was in mid-March. And at that point, um, they had started to raise money. And by, I think it was Monday the 23rd, they had raised enough to be able to say they could put in $150,000 towards helping people stay housed. Um, so that week, we decided that we would start actually taking those requests. And that evening, Monday, March 23rd, the city council, the Redwood City Council, decided to also put in $50,000 from our general fund to actually match that initial from the Redwood City Education Foundation. And then you're probably familiar with the very next is when the Board of Supervisors on March 24th did two important things. They passed the moratorium on evictions, which protected people for the months of March and April, excuse me, excuse me, April and May, um, so that if they were unable to pay their rent during that period of time, they could not be evicted. And that even after that period of time ended, they would still have at least 90 days to pay that rent. It meant the rent would still be owed, but they would have time to pay it. But that was why then clearly a rent assistance program was really important because even though they weren't going to get evicted, they still were going to pay their rent. Um, and then um, a couple weeks later, on June 6, our city council allocated additional funds, an additional $33,000 towards rent assistance. So we were really kind of in a good position to be able to receive requests and respond to the community. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I wanna share with you a presentation. Let's see. Ah, I'm just go like this. So I wanna start by talking about the demand the demand countywide. So this particular chart actually reflects the period, as you can see, of April 6th through 22nd. And you can see this is actually a representation of all across the county. So all of the agencies listed here are the different core service agencies that serve all of the parts of San Mateo County. And so Faro's Community Center serves Redwood City and North. We actually also serve Cortola Valley, Woodside, and Atherton. But as you might imagine, over the years and during this time, the vast, vast, vast majority of our requests, in fact, all of them, come from Redwood City and North Fair Oaks. So in this time frame of April 6th through May 22nd, you can see that we have the highest number of requests received from our community of Redwood City and North Fair Oaks. So what I would say is that um, it's a reflection of several things. One is I think it's a of course, in the, um, of Redwood City and North Fair Oaks. I also think it's a reflection of a few other things. One is that because of, I explained about the background, very early on, there was a lot of messaging in the community about, we will help you, come to Fair Oaks Center, ask for help. And that happened because of that initiative from the Redwood City Education Foundation and really them helping to get out the word, then the city making its decision. So it was something that was very public that people knew that there was going to be support for them in the community. Um, and then, and we'll get onto this in a little bit, there was also a generous outpouring in different ways. And so I already mentioned the Redwood City Education Foundation, the city of Redwood City, 
the county putting in funds, and then we also had some private funders that also stepped up to support. Um, so that was actually, again, a big part of, you know, knowing that we want to help, we want to support our folks. Um, and then the last part of, I think, what was also making a difference was that we reached out to our community partners in the Redwood City, North Fair Oaks area, a lot of the community partners that actually work directly with the community. And we shared with people um, some training and invited them to not only get the word out, but help people apply. Because we were seeing hundreds of people coming to request assistance, we realized early on that we had to figure out a way to streamline it. So we created an online application that could be some of the members of our community. So we really benefited from our community partners taking on the task of helping people to be able to apply. So our response from March 23rd to May received over 1,200 applications. <laughs> and what I want to say is that, and, and so what we did was when we hit May 10th, we realized, okay, we need to pause, want to be actually assist is eligible. So on May 11th, continued to read applications, but we decided and we decided that if you have an application, it will be on a wait list. And so we have a little over a hundred that are on the wait list. And hopefully in the next uh, week and a half, we'll have a better idea about capacity to potentially assist those people as well. But those people who are on the wait list know they are, and they know that they are waiting to hear whether or not they may be able to be consistent. What I wanna say is that we are very confident that we have sufficient funds and we're gonna go to a funding slide shortly, but we have sufficient funds for everybody who has applied. If they are eligible, we should be able to assist them at least with up to one full month of rent. Depending on their situation, some people don't ask for the full month, other people do ask for the full month, but in any case, we should be able to assist everybody who is eligible at least once. So what I do want to explain is the concept of the fund is to provide assistance to households who are unable to pay their rent, either part or all of it, uh, due to the economic loss caused by COVID-19 that do not have other alternative resources that would allow them to pay their rent. So important part of that criteria. It's not just affected by COVID-19, but it's also that there isn't another way that you're able to replace that income. So that's a piece of the, that's an important part of the criteria. So you can see our, um, we have spent um, over $7,000. We have approved over 421 cases. We have more to go. Um, and I did want to note that 30% of the cases that we have approved are from North Fair Oaks. The average amount of grant is about $2,000, so it ranges, um, and so that's, but that tends to be the average it is across the board over the weeks, that's been the average. We still have about 575 cases that are pending review. And so we've done some reorganizing this week, and so we are now planning on a new strategy with which we will be reaching out to all remaining the next couple of weeks. And in many ways, we're gonna be really leaving it up to individuals to also once we reach out to them to really respond back because part of the thing times too where you're going back and forth to people and that kind of thing. So that's our goal over the next couple of weeks is to actually reach out to all of the remaining applicants. So I was talking earlier about funding sources. So the first one I'm gonna mention, you can see at the top is SMC Strong Fund. So this is funds from the County of San Mateo. It was launched initially by an initial investment from the Board of Supervisors, and then there was this creation of this fund that you might be familiar with called the SMC Strong Fund that invited uh, corporate sponsors or foundations and individuals to contribute. Um, and then I was mentioning the city. So in the first two um, decisions by the city, that brought forward a little over half a million dollars, you can see, and then or more recent in, um, in early May was to uh, direct the use of our CDBG community, community Development Block Grant Dollars, which is federal funds. We received $448,000 specifically related to COVID-19. And so our city made the decision to devote that entire amount towards emergency rental assistance. And then we also had some funds from previous year that we could redirect. So we also redirected another $321,000 towards emergency financial assistance. 
And then the Red, Red City Education Foundation, you remember I said, they started with a pledge of 150. Well, they kept raising money. And so their contribution actually got all the way to $350,000. So that was really a wonderful additional contribution. And then we have a few other private grants that brought in another $90,000. So you can see we have over $2 million to fund the 1,200 applications. Now, again, we go through a process, so it might not be exactly 1,200 in the end that are funded, um, but that was where I was saying earlier that we feel quite confident that we're gonna have the funds to be able to assist everyone who's eligible amongst those who have applied. Um, so just in closing about the housing rental assistance piece, I just wanna say that, you know, we still have important challenges ahead. Um, I mentioned the wait list. As we have done uh, this work, there are definitely, um, there's a percentage of the households where it is not that likely they're going back to work right away. And so there's a percentage of households whom we would love to be able to help a second time, but I don't know that we will be able to, it depends. If we have the resources, maybe we could. And I would definitely say not every a second time, but there definitely is a portion of our population that absolutely will. And I all know and realize that not only some people be more delayed before they go back to work. There are other people who are not going back to work. They're not going back to the job they had. And so then, of course, you know, we have to be hopeful about hopefully they can find job. That's just to understand that we are not really understanding how much demand there would be. I thought it would be several hundred. I thought 500 seemed like, oh yeah, 500, 600. And then we hit a thousand all of a sudden. And so again, that was a real statement. Through the chair, I think um, Terry might have been disconnected. Right, it looks like she froze. Can we give it a couple of yeah. minutes to see if she can reconnect? Sorry for the technical inconveniences, but it, it happens um, all the time these days. Welcome back, Terry. You're muted. Unmute. Okay, oh, here we go. Anyway, we um, converted our emergency food, which is just like a drop-in type thing, to a regular daily distribution um, on uh, every day, Monday, uh, three to five. And then we also had our ongoing regular distributions and those continue to happen in larger scale. And second harvest during this time period for any program like this, anybody can come. And so they provide you with like a hundred extra allocations for every distribution you do. But then our Oaks have our broader community. So our Redwood City School District providing breakfast and as a drive-through pickup. And this was for any child under 18, doesn't have to be of the age of the school district doesn't have to be going to the school district schools they could go to a charter school um, and so that was a significant piece for our, with garfield and hoover being the more local ones for north fair oaks community the high school district providing lunches still for high school students that could be up by parents or children hot meals or to go meals being provided saint anthony still providing its food boys and girls stepping up to all of a sudden provide dinners monday through friday street life ministries expanding its regular monday program monday wednesday program beyond homeless individuals to families in our community in need and for grocery programs saint francis center already had a grocery program but then salvation army increased the number of days of theirs boys and girls club started bag grocery program as well. And then Cassia House, which is run by Catholic Worker, also providing groceries for our families. So a wonderful breadth of resources for our community. So at Fair Oaks, what we do is we let we provide people the food we eat. We also make sure that they know about the other opportunities that are available for them. So I'm gonna pause there or stop there and we can have questions. I will unshare to each other again. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Terry. Um, uh, needless to say, I I am impressed. Uh, I mean, I've I've heard um, you know a lot of um, the good information that you have provided through some of uh, some of the other um, 
uh, community stakeholders and also uh, local organizations uh, doing work. Um, I've heard about the Fairfax Community Center, and I commend you and thank you for that. Um, and I see a, a raised hand from uh, Council Member Juan Carlos Prado. Uh, yeah, through the uh, chair. Um, hello, Terry. Um, Hi. I, I wanted to uh, congratulate you for all your, your efforts. Um, my children, I have uh, two boys, 11 and 12, and they wanted to do a very small contribution to our Norfolk Oaks community. So through Facebook, we've been um, buying groceries and just people who, who you know, randomly need it that are on Facebook. And, and so, um, but I mean, in a very small way, but I if, if we yeah. don't, um, if we want to contribute to your emergency food, can people go to the Nor Norfolk Oaks Community Center and just drop off food so you can then later disperse it into the, the, our, our people in need in Norfolk Oaks? Yeah, I guess I, what I would say the best way that I would recommend that is through Second Harvest Food Bank. Of course, they have a warehouse in um, San Carlos. And so the food that we give out, we get from Second Harvest. It's actually, second, actually they're now called Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. So in terms of actual direct food stuff, that's really the best way to go, is to contribute directly through Second Harvest. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't see any other hand raised. Um, uh, one final question that I have, uh, Terry, is: it, Do you need anything from um, community members from uh, the uh, North Oaks Community Council specifically? I, at this moment, I do not think so. But thank you for that offer, and I would definitely keep that in mind um, because we have involved different people from the community, as you noted early on in our process. We also have the advantage of being a part of the city. And so because of the new operation under the shelter in place, we've actually been able to also redeploy staff from other departments like our library um, within our own department of parks and rec to assist us. But as we start to go into recovery and move back into place with some of the jobs that they normally do, it may well be that we could use some additional help. So I will absolutely keep that in mind. Of course, yeah. I mean, the offer is, is, is open. And thank you again for your report and for your uh, great work. We are very welcome. Um, are there any questions, uh, any public comment for this item, Mitzi? Oh, opening it up to public comment for agenda item number five. I do not see any raised hands at this time through the Zoom call. Uh, Victor, are there any um, people on the phone line that have questions? There are none at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra and Victor. And um, we will then move on to item number six on the agenda. Uh, it is uh, another presentation, this time from the Office of Community Affairs, Immigrant Services in regards to COVID-19 and the website. Um, it'll be presented by Jennifer uh, Lamas uh, from Immigrant Services. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jennifer Yamas. I work for the County of San Mateo Office of Community Affairs Immigrant Services. Um, it's really nice to see some familiar faces. This is my first time attending the North uh, Fair Oaks Council and I'm excited to be here. Um, so without further ado, I will be pre presenting on the COVID-19 resource page for residents and small business, um, for small businesses. So this page uh, we created directly in response um, Back in, I want to say late March, we um, at our immigrant forum and just through community, we know that there was a huge need um, for a compiled page of resources because so many of us were receiving so many emails um, on a daily basis. Um, and it was really hard to be able to track all of those emails. Um, and so we really wanted to create kind of like a main hub um, for all resources to be listed. Um, and so we um, responded with the COVID-19 resource page. So Mitzi, next slide, please. Um, and so just some key points I'll be going over quickly. Um, the county's COVID-19 homepage, our COVID-19 resource page, and processes to share resources with us and with the community. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so as you can see, this is the smcgob.org uh, homepage, which has become the County of San Mateo's um, COVID-19 homepage. And so immediately on the top right there, you'll see a translate button. And so um, all San Mateo County web pages have this translate button, which translates to the following languages, Arabic, Burmese, Simplified Chinese, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Tagalog. And these languages have been noted as some of the top languages spoken in San Mateo County. Um, next slide, please. And so um, where you can find our resource page, if you scroll down on that county's homepage, you'll see uh, this blue box called What to Know Now, and we are there listed in community resources. And actually, I'm happy to note that since we've created, um, since we've last updated this PowerPoint, we're actually listed three ways on the county's homepage now. So we have our own specific button dedicated to um, our homepage or to our county um, the COVID-19 page, which will link directly to us. And then we're also under a separate button called uh, Locate Assistance, and you can also find us there. So we, uh, just to repeat, we are listed on the county's homepage three times now. Um, next slide, please. And so when you um, utilize any of those three options that I just mentioned, this is what it will take you to. And so this is our COVID-19 resource page. And um, right off the bat, some things I want to highlight. Um, on the left, we have the COVID-19 public call center. So when you call 211, um, it's the non-emergency, non-medical um, line. And so anyone can call there. Um, also important to note that 34% uh, of our county is actually foreign born or at least 34%. And so we really wanted to make sure that our page was inclusive for all residents of San Mateo County. So that's why um, right off the bat, we included the California State Immigrant Resource Guide um, in English and in Spanish. And then also um, all our resources, we have vetted, we have called them, we have emailed them because we wanna make sure that we have resources that are available to all residents regardless of immigration status. So all resources that we have vetted have two asterisks listed next to them and you'll get to see what that looks like in the next couple of slides. Um, so next slide, please. Also important, we um, this year, actually 2020, we have updated our immigrant resource guide. It's called Immigrants Gateway to Resources. And what this is, it's a handbook full of um, an array of services, um, community-based organizations that um, are trusted and that work um, and serve our immigrant community. Um, and we have this handbook listed in English, Spanish and Chinese, and it's available to download and print there. Um, and it's really excited because it, it was um, updated this year. So all the information in there is pretty brand new um, or has been updated from the previous edition, which was 2017. Uh, next slide, please. So as you continue scrolling down our resource page, this is what it looks like. Um, you'll see that on the left there, we have um, San Mateo County Department Service Modifications. We have San Mateo County city specific information and we have San Mateo County shelter in place uh, frequently asked questions. So these will link directly um, to those pages. On the right, we have videos that actually some members of our office have created. Um, they are available in Spanish and Chinese and they talk about things such as the shelter in place order, um, what's an essential worker, why it's important to wear face coverings. Um, so those are really cool videos. Um, and then in the middle there is where you'll see um, the majority of all our resources. And so you can see that it's listed accordion style. So when you click on a specific header, that header will expand and all the resources that fall under that header will um, show up. And you'll see, a I'm going to go over just a couple of them um, for the sake of time. Um, next slide, please. So you'll see uh, the first one I want to highlight is the eviction information and assistance. So here we've listed San Mateo County's rent moratorium um, in all the different languages that are uh, that we've translated, included, including Spanish, simplified Chinese, Russian, Tagalog, and Portuguese. Um, so this is the one that was effective until May 31st. We do know that the Board of Supervisors this past Tuesday has extended that until June 30th. Um, so once we get those documents updated and translated, they'll be listed here. So please check back for those. Um, next slide, please. 
And so the next uh, tab that we want to highlight is financial resources. So you could see that, of course, we've included the core service agencies there that have been uh, so excellent at providing rent and utility assistance. Um, we've also included national funds and uh, local funds that have been providing emergency relief. And you can see there um, an example of the asterisks that I mentioned earlier. So um, all those uh, funds that are currently listed right there, those ones are available to all regardless of immigration status. Um, next slide, please. Um, so also I wanna highlight the food pantries. Um, San Mateo County's education system has created a really excellent list of um, school closure meal sites. And so it lists dates and times of all the different schools in San Mateo County where parents um, can go and pick up meals um, for their kids. And there's also a food distribution map where you can type in your zip code. And when you type in your zip code, um, it'll tell you all the school meal sites that are around you. Um, Second Harvest Food Bank, of course, also has their hotline and they also have their texting tool where you can text get food and it'll tell you um, nearby distribution sites. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next tab I wanna highlight is the health services. We've listed here mental and physical. Um, and um, of course, the first thing that we've listed there is the San Mateo County Health Link. Um, all the latest health information is there. So we've uh, linked directly back to the San Mateo County Health. And then also we've included um, fact sheets available in multiple languages um, about COVID-19, what to do if you're sick, what you need to know. Also under this tab, we have health insurance providers like our county's ACE program that is specifically for undocumented residents. We also have Covered California because right now they're offering a special enrollment period because so many people are losing their jobs or um, losing their health insurance because maybe now they're working um, less hours. So you'll find all of those kind of resources under the health services tab. Um, next slide, please. And then the last tab I'm gonna go over is the small business resources tab. Um, and so we really uh, we really know how hard business, small businesses have been um, affected by COVID-19. So we tried to create a pretty long list um, of, of resources, including state resources, nationwide resources, and San Mateo County resources like Sam Cita, Oppor um, Opportunity Fund, and then also um, small Business Majority has provided webinars in English and Spanish um, for small businesses to learn about how to obtain resources. Um, so we've also included links there. Um, and next slide, please. And so that kind of um, goes over like a general overview of our website. Um, so if you are on the website and you notice that there's a resource there that hasn't um, been added, or maybe you know of a resource that has, you know, for example, run out of funds, um, you can email communityaffairs at smcgov.org, and then we will review, vet, and add all relevant resources. And we do this on a daily basis. Um, next slide, please. And so just to conclude my presentation, um, I'm, I'm asking everyone here if they can please help share the website um, on Twitter, Nextdoor, Facebook, email, um, social media. You know, in the first couple of weeks, we had almost 10,000 hits to our website. So we know that there is a great need for these kinds of resources, and we wouldn't have been able to get this many hits without everyone sharing our website. And so we really, really are thankful for all the work that our partners have done in spreading the word. But of course, um, we need to continue spreading the word. Um, and uh, that concludes my presentation. So, uh, thank you. And so I'll take any questions if there are any. Sorry, thank you very much, Jenny, uh, for your presentation. Great resources. And yes, I've, I've heard from people who have accessed some of those resources uh, already. Very useful. Thanks. Thank um, and if there are any questions from um, fellow council members, uh, you can raise your hand. I don't see any at this point. So, um, is there any public comment? So, are there any public comments on agenda item number six? Um, I don't see any from the Zoom call. Victor, are there any on the line? There are none at the moment. Okay, thank you so much. Great, thank you very much again. Thank you.
And we will move on to item number seven on the agenda. Um, it'll be a presentation from the Office of Community Affairs, um, the North Herox Business Outreach Effort. And it'll be presented by Jose Moreno, uh, the manager um, and analyst for San Mateo County. Is that correct? That's correct. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, good afternoon or good evening. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for those that are joining virtually. My name is Jose Moreno. I am new to San Mateo County, having just joined the team in February. I was asked to prepare an overview of the Community Affairs Office outreach efforts during the shelter in place order, specifically what we've been doing to notify business owners and their employees about programs and support services available to them. You could go to the next slide, please. I wanted to, uh, before I dive into the details, I wanted to kind of give you a, a quick uh, look at what our goal was or our, what our goal is. It's pretty simple. Uh, and that was to keep small business communities informed of the various resources available to them and their employees during the COVID-19 crisis. Next slide, please. So as you can see, um, what you have in front of you is a broad overview of our efforts. Um, what we've done is introduced, uh, uh, I've introduced myself to the business community through the email outreach as face-to-face -face meetings were not possible due to the shelter in place order. We directed uh, the community to, to a one-stop resource, which you just heard about from uh, my colleague, Jennifer, a uh, uh, site that's just full of information. We promoted loan opportunities, encouraged initiatives, and surveyed to make sure our messaging was reaching out to the intended audience, as well as doing uh, direct outreach. Next slide, please. We quickly came to the conclusion as a situation where it was developing and um, you know things began to get to a almost crisis level as uh, you know the COVID and the impact of it rolled out. And we realized we needed to get information as, uh, as a situation would continue to remain fluid and plans and programs would change in order to adjust to the ongoing circumstances. Uh, we needed to get as much information out as possible and direct people to a, a site where as information changed, uh, they would have the latest and greatest. And that's what uh, you know Jennifer just shared with you. Uh, we continually continually updated the information on the website as we couldn't keep printing flyers as information changed. We created a one-page guide that targeted employees and employers. Uh, we directed folks to our website. We worked with Sam Cita to get the word out on various uh, loan programs that were being provided. And we provided a one-stop contact information where people could reach out to me uh, or my uh, colleagues on getting information about uh, what was out there, what kind of uh, services were being, being provided to uh, small businesses. Next slide, please. Uh, what you see there is uh, our first effort. We did our direct mail to 155 businesses uh, from a list that was voluntarily provided to us from uh, a mailing list that was provided to us from past contacts that we've had with, uh, with business owners. By the way, the documents that you're going to be seeing, some you'll see in Spanish, some you'll see in English. Um, but uh, we wanted to assure you that all our communications was sent out in both languages to the uh, North Fair Oaks Corridor. So you will see samples of each in, uh, in various languages. I mean, in Spanish and in English. Next slide, please. Uh, there you have, we have uh, our comprehensive page uh, where we put uh, a lot of the information um, that we compiled as the situation was evolving. Uh, different food banks were opening. They were having uh, folks come by and pick up food at different times. Uh, we put together phone numbers, email addresses, uh, and links for folks to be able to access all types of information, whether it be a federal, state, program, what food banks were doing, when they were opening and closing, what days they were going to be doing, uh, you know, doing business and, and handing out food, as well as uh, information on small business administration and also unemployment information that was critical to those employees that were, uh, that were being let go. 
Next slide, please. Here's a kind of an overview and a timeline as how things developed. Um, we initiated uh, all of uh, all of our programs, and um, and one of the ones that would, that I really wanted to call out, as you see, the different times that went through there was. Uh, the effort that we put forth to get information on the Great Plates application program. We wanted to make sure that our restaurants in the North Fair Oaks area were going to be able to participate in the program where uh, food for seniors and other meal providers were going to be uh, handed out. And there was the opportunity there, if you had the, uh, the resources and the staff for restaurants to apply the problem was that it was a state application and it was uh, only in English and we went through the trouble of uh, translating it and getting that information uh, to some of the restaurants. And we also did direct outreach to them by calling them and see if this was something that, that they would be interested in. And then once we got uh, enough information from folks, we decided to go ahead and, um, and roll it out and send out the information to them so they could go ahead and apply if they uh, they thought they qualified to participate. Next slide, please. That is what you have in front of you is an example of what we've uh, been doing in the last uh, two weeks. Both the staff uh, and myself have gone door to door now that the uh, regulations as far as uh, being able to enter and exit from, from businesses have relaxed. Uh, we've gone out and engaged with the, uh, the business owners along the corridor and asked them uh, to help us get information out to their employees for them and for any residents that have come in and that are customers and uh, be able to understand what is going on and where they can get information. Uh, again, it's the webpage that we referenced earlier and we, uh, we just had a presentation on. And also, uh, as you can see in the next slide, if you go to the next slide, please. We are uh, continuing to push to get information out to our residents about census. Uh, we are still having uh, a low turnout in the hard to count communities. A lot of them are adjacent to the NFO corridor. So we wanna make sure that we continue that push and that effort uh, to get folks to uh, self, uh, self report and go on, be proactive and go on to the census website and fill out the, uh, the application uh, the census form. Next slide, please. This is just a quick representation of uh, some of the partnerships that we've uh, that we've been able to uh, to forge as we've done our outreach efforts, working with SAMCEDA and other community organizations uh, to get the word out on what programs are are available. Next slide. Um, through various sources, we were receiving feedback that Latinos were not applying for the various businesses, loans, and other financial help that was being provided by federal, state, and local lenders. So we decided to be proactive and do a survey of the 96, 96 businesses, which we had emails for, and conducted a very short and informal survey, which asked three very simple questions. Uh, did you receive information about business loans and grants? If you received information, did you apply? And if you didn't, why didn't you apply? So if you could go to the next slide. And there's uh, some of the results that you see in front of you. 83% uh, of the folks said that they had received information and 17% said they had not. Next slide, please. Thank you, that one. Uh, if you receive information, did you apply? 58% folks said no, 42% uh, of folks said yes. And then the last slide, please. And I think this one had, uh, you know, the most, uh, this was the most interesting to me is uh, why, if you didn't apply, why not? It almost broke out evenly across all three uh, responses that we, that we provided to folks. Um, folks, a third of the folks said application was too confusing. A third said I did not have supporting documents that were requested. And a third or said the deadline uh, was uh, too short. And then there was also a response that there was other, um, other factors that prevented them from 
from applying. Now, this, this information really isn't um, shocking in that recently I've seen other data and uh, there's been data reported in the news. Um, as a matter of fact, the other day driving, I heard a report uh, on NPR that spoke about uh, some of the data that Stanford has gathered about uh, black and brown businesses not receiving financial support from the plans that were put forth uh, by various entities. And the reason why is still not known, but uh, that that data that, uh, you know, that uh, Hispanic and African-American businesses are just not participating or not uh, being part of the, or having access to the, um, the programs that have been put out there. Uh, some of them have even happened on the, uh, on a local level. Um, I know that there's been a, a Renaissance San Mateo put on a, a huge effort in the North Fair Oaks quarter to uh, invite folks to participate, participate on web-based meetings, uh, to get free counseling and direction on how to access these loans uh, free of a charge. And um, I participated in the FECS web first webinar that they had, and it was uh, just uh, a very disappointing and very low turnout. So those, that um, includes my presentation. Thank you for uh, being patient with me as we sorted through the slides, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Mr. Moreno, and uh, welcome to um, the County of San Mateo. Muchas gracias. De nada. Um, I see one hand raised from uh, Linda Lopez for um, uh, comments or questions on um, this item. Uh, Linda, can you hear us or can you use the mic now? Through the chair, I don't think she can. Um, she's unmuted, but there's no sound coming out. Right. Um, Linda, if you can text me your um, question, I can, I can read it. Um, uh, but in the meantime, um, I'll ask a question, uh, Mr. Moreno. So um, what was the, the sampling um, number roughly of the... Uh, of the questionnaire that you um, just showed up results for? Yeah, we sent it out to 96 uh, email addresses that we had. And it was just uh, the Middlefield Road uh, commercial corridor, you said? Correct. Right. Oh, I guess, and um, so Linda is telling me that um, her hand uh, raised was actually for the previous um, item, so not for this item. So, um, sorry about that. And um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so some, something that I wanted to say about the business community is that it's, it's actually, um, uh, uh, the most affected. I've heard from uh, a couple of businesses that uh, yes, indeed, the uh, the the financial opportunities, uh, both federal and um, county um, opportunities, were um, brief, um, and uh, also the applications were. Um, a little bit uh, dreadful in the sense that they look complex. And yeah. ma many of our business owners, um, uh, English is not their primary language. And you know, some of them are seniors actually. They have been here in the community for many years. And, and um, uh, they, they actually need handholding when it comes to uh, applications that are complex as for uh, business purposes. And, and so um, it is understandable why, you know, a lot of the minority businesses um, are or were confused and are still confused about, you know, whether they apply, uh, whether they qualify for some of these uh, opportunities or not. Some of them don't, um, don't have uh, employees or they have... Um, employees that are not necessarily um, formally on board, you know, employed. Right. They're um, just 
informally employed, let's put it that way. And, and so um, there is a vast array of issues that many of these businesses, these small uh, family owned businesses have, and they do need uh, more assistance than the regular uh, business owner. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I believe that many of them, I'm not sure if they um, will survive um, as a matter of fact, you know, this pandemic, um, uh, because they're in economic shambles. And um, so one of my questions, I guess, you know, after all this uh, litany would be if, there, if, if the county of San Mateo may be able to provide further uh, financial assistance or, you know, uh, a contingency plan um, for um, additional funding for some of these businesses? And um, can the county um, prepare in advance some sort of um, a, um, a, either training or um, uh, help uh, so that some of these business owners can uh, have the documentation ready and be able to walk through, you know, um, some of the applications because also the digital divide um, is, is, is a big issue. You know, some of these uh, business owners, um, they are not technically savvy. Um, they wouldn't know how to fill out an application um, through the computer. Um, and so those are many of the issues that, that some of these businesses are going through. Chair Rodriguez, if, if I may, it's Justin Mates, Deputy County Manager. Um, thank you for that for that insight. You know that is some of the um, information we've received back um, from Jose Moreno and the, the work that we've been doing to outreach businesses, and also just anecdotally, we've heard some of the same things that you've just raised in terms of the limitations and the barriers to um, uh, certain businesses and and individuals to accessing the kinds of financial support and other programs that have been made available. Um, so there's a few things going on. I wanted to just share with the group. Um, first of all, all of this feedback on on, on access is something that's being um, shared and considered and and um, analyzed with respect to any future or ongoing program to exactly the same types of things you're talking about. Um, you know, perhaps uh, longer lead times for applications. Uh, maybe you know application centers in the you know on the ground where people can go for assistance. You know, even having to un upload documents, right? If you don't have a scanner at home, how can you do this? Or you're a small business, you don't have that. You might need some assistance. So, um, you know, in the beginning, there was an, a, a, a desire to get programs um, up and running very quickly, um, and 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 speed was a was a big consideration. Um, but certainly, uh, in future programs, we are looking at all of that and making sure we accommodate everybody's needs. The county has actually looked at, uh, to, is looking in the longer term now. Uh, as we all know, this is a very unique kind of disaster that doesn't go away. It doesn't just, you don't just start recovery right away. It's a disaster that's lingering and will, and will be in our community for quite some time. And so the county uh, retained a consultant to help us design uh, uh, on our longer term plan um, uh, uh, for like the, for all, uh, like uh, both short and medium and long-term um, plan. And part of that process in developing that plan for everything from emergency response to economic recovery, um, to support for schools, all sorts of things that affect our county, not just things that are uh, you know, controlled by the county government or influenced by the county government, but all sorts of things are in that plan. And um, part of that plan is looking at longer range um, economic recovery for our small business community, particularly small businesses, family-owned businesses, businesses in in vulnerable and hard to reach communities like uh, parts of North Fair Oaks. Um, so I don't have anything to report right now in terms of um, a, a specific future program, but I did want to let you know there's a robust planning process um, that's going into looking at what sorts of programs we can go uh, move to moving forward, where, what kinds of funding might be available for those programs. And that, um, that process is attempting to be as inclusive as possible. Some, some of you may already have 
been asked to um, participate or have maybe seen this uh, the, the 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 workings of the plan. But once the plan is there, it, it just provides a list of many strategies and ideas. And so there's going to be more discussion, more input from the community that will go into designing future programs. And certainly the outreach and assistance for the application process will be part of those programs. Um, but but all of that is in the works and considered. And we will continue to reach out uh, to the North Fair Oaks uh, community generally and also to this council for your feedback on these future programs. Thanks very much, uh, Justin. Um, so it turns out that Linda Lopez indeed had a question uh, uh, on this item. And um, these are actually two questions that I'm gonna read uh, briefly. So the first question is, are you in collaboration with community-based organizations currently working with um, a, a residential and businesses? Um, and the second question is, uh, what is the method for conducting the outreach? Yeah, right now we uh, have not been able to do, well, until just lately we've been doing, um, we have not been able to go door to door. As I, I mentioned earlier, the outreach in the last two weeks has been door to door. We've been distributing flyers with the, uh, directing folks to our webpage. So that's one of the ways we are, we're reaching out. Um, I, <clears throat> I, as I mentioned, I did sit in, sat in uh, one of the uh, meetings that were organized online. Unfortunately, I think to your point and to the experience that we've had, just uh, doing outreach to folks online, there is the, the challenge of folks not having internet connection, not being having internet savvy, not having big computer savvy. That's going to be a... Um, you know, a hurdle that we're going to have to figure out on how to do this. The, you know, probably the best approach approach would be hands-on working with folks. Uh, as Justin mentioned, probably having a drop-in center. Uh, that is probably the more successful strategies, but we can't implement those until, you know, we have more direction on how we're going to be able to meet in person and uh, continue to work through the uh, you know, the internet and the, the divide that's kind of preventing us from doing the, the best outreach that we know works, which is face-to-face -face and working with folks on a one-to-one -one basis. Right. Yeah, so the, 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 the uh, second question from uh, Linda actually alludes to the fact that this, um, uh, that this goes uh, to before the, the pandemic where um, community-based organizations uh, are not approached to um, assist some of the businesses. And so um, it is proven that, you know, uh, many, of, uh, many of the community stakeholders um, uh, have, uh, I guess, uh, uh, an already proven ability to, um, you know, do work with some of these business owners since we know some of them and and uh, uh, some of these needs are already known so you know uh, trying to reinvent the wheel without um, the uh, community organizations uh, participation um, it, it may not necessarily uh, be able to um, to help out you know in in a full manner to some of these um, business owners. Yeah, if you have any suggestions of organizations that we can get in touch with, be happy to take that information and uh, and begin outreach and, and working when partnering with them. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands raised from council members. And are, are there any questions for, um, uh, from uh, the community? Any um, public comment? Let's see. So are there any public comments on agenda item number seven? Now would be the time to raise your hand. And I do not see any comments there or raised hands. Um, Victor, are there any comments, public comments on the line? There are none. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much. And um, I guess uh, it's already 9.04.
um, being mindful of time, I should ask, um, are we still uh, proceeding with, uh, um, with the other item left, uh, Mitzi, or Justin? Yes, to the chair, I am pulling it up right now. Chair Rodriguez, I think we can maybe just summarize really quickly. We really wanted to just um, get an opportunity to tell uh, and present to the council on some of our additional outreach efforts. I think Jose Moreno already covered a lot of what we're doing with respect to the businesses. Um, uh, you know, the, it, we know both anecdotally and um, because of census response rates, we know that there are certain communities in our county that um, uh, for a number of reasons, our county messages is a little harder to get out there. We have less uptake of our county messages. Uh, and so uh, while there's a very robust communication uh, plan with respect to COVID-19 uh, health and other information, we also know that that traditional plan needs to be supplemented for um, for our hard to reach communities. And so we just wanted to present very quickly today on, on some of those strategies. Um, I, I'll skip to, next, the, to the first few slides here. Next slide. Um, just if you go back one slide, I'm sorry. We just want, there's three groups of information we just want to make sure that all of our communities have access to. Um, and uh, the last one is the one Jose uh, just presented on with respect to businesses. But the first two is, you know, we really want to make sure that all residents have access to the, the necessary health information they need to protect them and, and themselves and their families. You know, as we know in this COVID-19 crisis, the, the health information can change quickly. The latest health orders, the information uh, sometimes changes every couple of weeks nowadays. And so uh, there's a need to not only get information out there, but to make sure to connect residents to um, sources of information that they can trust and that are reliable. Um, and so we want to get that accurate information to them. Uh, and then the second category is also just the, it, it kind of goes to the um, resources that Jennifer presented on earlier. There's a lot of resources out there. There's, there's a lot of need as well, but there's a lot of resources and we wanna make sure that our residents and all of our hard to reach communities, but also specifically North Fair Oaks uh, are aware of those resources and know how to, to access them. And those are the, that's the information we really wanna get out to the community. Next slide. Our strategies in this area are informed a great deal by uh, what we know from census and our census outreach efforts. And so a lot of the strategies listed here, and I won't go through all of them, they're based on our best um, thinking with respect to census outreach efforts. And actually the timing of COVID uh, has actually um, presented a bit of an opportunity because the census is still going on. And so a lot of the resources and the networks that we activated to get the census message out uh, can also be used to, uh, to uh, can also be leveraged to get COVID-19 information out there. And so when um, when Emma and her team are, are meeting with uh, our, our um, uh, census groups that we have in specific areas, including North Fair Oaks, uh, we can also have discussions about, okay, how do we get our COVID-19 information out? What's the best way to do that under the current circumstances? And we've already had um, some good success with that, with leveraging the resources that are already in place for census messaging for COVID-19 messaging. And now I'll hand it over to Emma and she'll talk to you about some of the specific things that have been done with respect to North Fair Oaks. Next slide. You know, I think the message is really simple. We want everybody to know is how to stay safe, how to access this, the information that and the resources that we have. As Justin and, and you see here today, there are lots of resources available. And sometimes it's just allowing people and then really directing them to that location, whether it's online, whether it's using accessing or 211 for those that don't have digital, you know, do, they don't have digital access. And so we really want to make sure that, at, that the message is tailored um, to make sure that the information gets out the most effective. Next slide. No matter what the channels we're using, whether it's a Facebook or a billboard or testimonial videos or a door hanger, we need to repeat this key tailored message over and over again. The message will change over time and we will continually monitor and adapt our message to the situation as the situation evolves. But no matter how the message may evolve, we will continue to frame using the same template and focus on key messaging that we need to get out that has to be easy to understand statements and that are repeated consistently in language. And I wanna thank, you know, some of you have already provided us some of those videos, those influencer videos as well to relate these same key messages. Next slide, please. 
These are some of the things that we already have in progress. As you heard today, we've um, just presented the COVID resource page. We've done some tutorials, as Jennifer mentioned, a tutorial on how to access that resource page, both in English, Spanish, and Chinese. We've provided the flyers, as you've seen, to the business, small business community. And we've worked in collaboration with the Community Collaborative um, Success for Partners of North Fair Oaks um, as, and, and created some town hall opportunities. We've did, done a distribution of face covering masks targeting the vulnerable communities. We've now distributed over a thousand face coverings in North Fair Oaks specifically. Next slide, please. In our, in our high priority activities, um, our approach is to roll out this approach in the hard to count communities and in language using a very micro targeted approach. We're working with local, the local school district to see if we can utilize their mass um, notification phone system. And in fact, I'm happy to report we are um, using their uh, robo system to send information to families as well as incorporate their message into their e-newsletters and Facebook. So we are happy to report that we have um, worked and doing that and implementing that into our Redwood City School District. Similarly, we are working with the local libraries uh, to find ways on how to help us in outreach and using their communication channels as we've done this through census. Finally, we're working with other municipalities um, to understand what is working and how best to complement those existing messages. Very back to what you said, let's, let's hear what's working and try to um, build upon that. And so, so here's just a list of some of the things that we're already working on. Next slide, please. Um, for some of you, you might have already seen that we are using this really micro-targeted approach and we've targeted by, so we're able to really target by zip code and by language. And so these are some of the advertising that you're already seeing by 94063, targeting 94063. And um, they are on whether you're accessing through the streaming online. And so they're coming, this is just a sample. Next slide, you might have another one. Oh, that was our, go back, sorry. Um, there are uh, other ones that have been out, but I'm just presenting the ones that we have today. And so we drew, again, we are messaging key messages. So part of the, the ability to use the digital ads is that we can change messages very quickly, instantly, and do it micro-targeted by age, by group, by language, and really direct um, our messaging. So if there is, as last week we announced a new testing sites, we were quickly able to direct our testing site locations to East Palo Alto and really promote that as well. And so as new messaging comes out and evolves and we're able to adapt our tactics as well here. Next slide, please. Um, we're also creating these short uh, videos and we went and reached out to our local influencers, elected uh, council members such as yourselves and ask those community influencers to help us relate this message. And again, the idea is to make sure that the message is getting penetrated down to our community level. And then we're also working on, and we have developed phone, phone bank opportunities where community organizations are helping us participate and getting that message out. Next slide, please. Some of those ongoing activities, as we said, we're gonna to continue to work with the Children's Collaborative um, Children's Collaborative uh, for Success. We're working through our elected officials such as yourself and, and board members and developing frequently asked questions and flyers. We're adapting our messaging. We actually um, did a, a beta test before our you know, door hanger. We reached out to community partners and tested the messaging to see if it was the most appropriate. And then with that developed a door hanger and we'll be doing our door hanger distribution now that we've, you know, uh, ease a little bit on um, on our shelter and order place, but we'll be uh, doing safe social distancing door hanging distribution next week in North Fair Oaks where 5,200 door hangers will be distributed. We're also creating an opportunity where we can create a listserv for our community members in North Fair Oaks where those can sign up to get e-newsletter information and updates in language. The one thing that we have come across and it was very clear through our beta testing is not everybody has access. And so we have to find opportunities where we can do direct mail and information and provide it in language as well to our households in North Fair Oaks. And so we're working on that as well. Next slide, please. 
um, and some of the metrics that we're going to use to see have have we made an impact in North Fair Oaks, and that will be through behavior change, feedback from our community partners. Uh, we're also going to be able to tell and, and number, get the number of subscriptions that have uh, signed up for our COVID newsletter, as well as we're capturing the number of visits that can take place from our, our to our website because we can track where the visits come from and what language and where they're most being used, as well as that being the number of hits to their COVID resource page. Next slide, please. Again, we are using much of this effort that we have learned best from our census data. As you may know, census right now for the state of California, San Mateo County is leading the efforts and across the um, state. And so we are using, as Justin said, our best work that we know but that comes through the efforts and the feedback that we're getting from our community partners and influencers such as yourself. Because um, we're not here to reinvent the wheel, but we need to know what works and what's that right message. And so thank you tonight and let me know if I can answer any questions. Yeah, um, thank you very much to both uh, Justin Mates, um, Deputy County Manager, and Emma Gonzalez, Community Affairs uh, Manager, for uh, your comments and presentation. Um, uh, I don't see any hands raised for uh, questions, uh, so I will move directly to see if there's any um, community uh, public comment. Are there any public comments for agenda item number eight? And I don't see any raised hands. Um, Victor, are there any comments on the line? There are none. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and so if we have a, on item number nine, if we have a supervisor's report, um, that'll be great. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is Maggie with Supervisor Slocum's office. I am going to give a very short report. I just wanted to tell you uh, um, myself, Justin Mates, and Mike Halleckie all took a tour um, to North Fair Oaks to visit uh, Sister Christina El Paisano, um, some Baron residents, and some other, and another resident that uh, was recommended by Caron. Um, and the purpose of this tour was to really talk to um, our community partners and as well as some of the residents and people and um, a business of North Oaks and understand what their needs are during this time and um, what challenges, challenges they've had. Um, and we've had some really great presentations today about how those, how those needs are being met, which is whether it's like food, um, food needs, rental assistance, uh, uh, needing business, business information or outreach or COVID-19 resources. Um, so we did that a, maybe like two weeks ago and um, now we're working on next steps to see um, what comes out of it. If there's not any, if there's questions um, or comments, Thank you very much, uh, Maggie. I hope you and your family are doing well. Um, I don't see any hands raised. Um, so I'm assuming um, there aren't any questions. Um, and do we have a county manager's report? Justin Mace, Deputy County Manager. Just a real quick uh, item. You know, one of the items of feedback we've gotten from the community recently is a desire for, for free testing, COVID-19 testing in North Fair Oaks. As you may know, the state has a vendor here in the county that provides um, uh, free testing. We've been working on some logistics to support that vendor. Uh, they started just in San Mateo, but now they're going to uh, additional places, Daly City, um, East Palo Alto, and the coast side, and there's been a request for additional uh, site in North Fair Oaks. We are working on it. I, I unfortunately don't, I cannot announce specifics today because they're not set yet, but we are working very hard uh, with the state's vendor to try to get um, at least, you know, a rotating uh, uh, site in, in North Fair Oaks. So when that information is available, uh, we will announce it and uh, uh, Emma's team will help us get the word out in North Fair Oaks so people are aware of it. But I just want to let you know that that is something that we are working uh, very actively with the state's vendor to try to get that from North Fair Oaks. And I have nothing else to uh, report on the county manager's report. Thank you. 
Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, are there any council members uh, reports? If there are any, please ra raise your hand. And I don't see any. So I think it's safe to say that we can adjourn the meeting. I want to appreciate everybody's time and patience uh, since we run a little over um, after 9 p.m. So thanks very much. Thank you, everybody, for the work you are doing. Uh, is um, definitely making an impact. And um, we are all in this together. We are all uh, an important component of this puzzle. And somehow we will get through um, in, you know, um, in good health. So thank you very much. Uh, good night. And we'll hope to see you soon. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.